an uncomfortable truth. Yesterday, Saturday, they had the Ladies' Day at Newberry. And for those of you that don't know, at Newberry, Ladies' Day means the men cook. And that's all cool. I am one of the cooks. Uh, Jess Carter, he's the minister at Newberry. He's another one of the cooks. And Tom is the third cook we had there yesterday. So I'm doing what I normally do, and I'm doing it better than I normally do, meaning I had the oven mitts on. I have a problem with oven mitts. Half the time I forget about them, and I grab something because it's a cookie sheet. Obviously, cookies, they're good for you, right? They can't hurt you. And I grab the thing, and I burn my hand. After I put my hand in my mouth, I go wash my hand. Um, so I got both oven mitts on because I'm dealing with a cast iron skillet. Now, some cast iron skillets are deceiving, some aren't. The biggest one I deal with is about this big around, that deep, and weighs about 30 pounds without the meat in it. And this one wasn't that big, but it's one of the larger size cast iron skillets. And I know, if there's too much batter in this and I don't have a good hand underneath the handle the right way, it's gonna tip and I'm in trouble. So I'm checking it out. Yeah, it looks like it's mostly done. I reach in, I grab. And then you hear, yow! Now I had the oven mitt on. I already said that. I had both oven mitts on. There was a problem. There was a thin spot in this oven mitt. There was the outside layer that I could see, and I had looked inside. There weren't holes inside. So there was the inside layer. But separating that outside layer and inside layer was nothing. And boy, did I feel the heat of that handle. And I go, yeah. And Jess goes, what's the matter? And I go, I got burned by this stupid, stupid thing. And he goes, well, I can fix that. And I go, okay. And I've got the skill up on top there. I immediately put the other hand underneath of it so I wasn't having to hold on too hard on the handle and I put it down. And I hand him the thing, wham, and he just throws it in the trash. And I'm like, whoa, because my brain heard one word. I can fix that thing. And I thought, well, okay, he's planning on doing something where he's going to fix it. Well, he fixed it permanently. And to tell you how bad I was about this, I kept thinking about that all day yesterday. I was thinking about it all night long. And I'm like, man, how in the world could he have fixed it? And then I actually thought all the way through. You'd have to take off all that stitching, take off the covering that was on it to get down to the batting that's inside, the stuff that was supposed to be protecting my poor innocent patty that didn't. Because if you don't go that far, if all you do is put another layer on the outside, you add one level of cloth to two other levels of cloth, I'm sorry, you grab that handle, you're still getting burned. The only way to fix it was almost to replace the whole thing, the batting inside, make sure that the material hadn't worn out in the back and the front. And I realized, yeah, uh, the amount of time it was gonna take you to do all that seam ripping and stuff and to take out the batting inside, put the batting another type inside, you gotta do a right kind of stitching on the batting because if you stitch down the batting, you make it tight, in which case it's not going to work. If you don't have some kind of stitching, it's going to move around and it's not going to work. So the amount of effort it takes to make an old oven mitt work is so not worth it. And the amount of time I spent thinking about it was so not worth it. The truth was that oven mitt was dangerous because if I hadn't grabbed it with two oven mitts and had the time to get that other hand underneath and take the pressure off, what was going to happen? I was going to drop the thing. What was underneath of me? A nice oven door with glass in the middle so you can look and see what's inside that you're cooking. I could have broken that oven door and then how much is that oven mitt now costing us? It'd be costing us the cost of the oven, plus my poor burned patty. Yeah, sometimes the right answer is a lot stronger than we're comfortable with. And I like the picture I found. I thought this is a really cool picture. I don't know how they did this. 
but you got that house on what looks like the edge of some parking garage top or something there. And if you were a real estate agent, you would market it. This is a unique property. It has a scenic view and it's nearly half off. And you'd be telling the truth, except it's nearly half off the edge up there. And oh yeah, that's a scenic view. I don't want to be standing on the side where those windows are. There's a scary truth to what we're looking at. And just because the words make it sound okay, doesn't change what you're looking at. And going back to the passage I've already read, Luke 20, starting with verse one. Now it happened on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests, the scribes, together with the elders confronted him. This does not sound like a small, comfortable group. This sounds like a minor mob. And they spoke to him saying, tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? And on the surface, that sounds like a legitimate question. They might really want to know, because in tight, <laughs> who it was that gave him this power, gave him this authority, unless we know, like John chapter 3, where it says, verse 1 and 2, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. When we're talking Luke chapter 20, we're talking near the end of his life. When we're talking John chapter 3, we're talking near the beginning of his ministry. At the beginning of his ministry, the Pharisees already know you couldn't do these signs except by the power of God. And if you've got the power of God backing you, uh, we understand where that means you're coming from. Oh, and by the way, I'm sneaking out in the middle of the night because if the rest of the Pharisees find out what I'm doing, I'm in deep trouble. The Pharisees knew where the power was, where the authority was by which Jesus did the signs, by which Jesus taught. They knew it from the beginning of his ministry. They're not asking a polite, comfortable question, even though it sounds reasonable. And if we jump a bit farther back in John, or closer to the beginning of John, John 1, 19 through 25. Now, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, same crowd, and they asked him saying, why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Let's take off what they said and listen to what John's answer was. Because, all right, those questions that they asked were all entrapment questions. One, are you Elijah? I'm taking these out of order. Their understanding was when Elijah came, it was literally Elijah who had gone up into heaven in the flaming fiery chariot was coming back in person. They knew about John's beginning. They knew his dad had gone into the temple and came out mute. They knew there was something special different about John. So if you claim to be Elijah, boy, are you in trouble? Because you're not the Elijah we want. 
We want the one who calls down fire from on heaven and can destroy Rome for us. Are you that prophet? And <laughs> we really mean, are you Elijah? We're just trying to trap you on that one. Think about what John's answer is, though. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Do you have to be able to call fire from on high down to destroy Rome to save people? We worship a God who expects us to be his people, a people who lives by his standard. And he's made known his standard from a long, long time ago. And how we're living today doesn't measure up. We need to turn in our actions. We need to turn in our hearts. Does it take Elijah to say that? No. Would it take the Christ, the Messiah, the one who would redeem his people to say, folks, there's God's standard and there's everything else. And boy, are we missing it. No. It took the one who was willing to say, there's God's way. And there's the way we've been living. We need to get a clue, get right, because God is so worthy and worth it. They didn't listen to that answer because that answer didn't enable them to get the trap set, boom, sprung, and nail them. Because, okay, there's the, there's the next question. Well, if you're not Elijah and you're not the Christ, how in the world do you think you got the authority to do this baptism? If he couldn't answer them directly on the first set of questions, I'll tell you right now, no way can he answer them directly on this one either because they're not looking for the answer. And when we're talking about Luke chapter 20, when Jesus has been teaching and showing the signs for almost three full years, they're not looking for the answer then. Because he answered them and said, I also will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Remembering what John's answer was. Who am I? What am I? I am calling the people back to their God. What was his baptism? It was a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. They never asked him and broke down the baptism. Because the truth is, what was their real bigger hang up? Wasn't the forgiveness of sins aspect. It was that somebody that wasn't the they, the it people, was talking about repenting and turning to God. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, I'm the guy who's up front. So being I am the it man, then you need to come to me. And we all get that that it man business is so wrong. They were asking a trap question. They could care less about people turning. They wanted to preserve their position. And like I said, what was the work of John? It was to turn the hearts of the people back to the Father. It's the last chapter of Malachi. When it was all over with the Old Testament, unless the heart of the Father is turned to the children, the heart of the children is turned to the Father, I will come back and curse the land. What did John do? He came to fulfill the last message of Malachi. To prepare the hearts of God's children. Because they were so in the wrong place. And like I said, where was this message really from? You could say it was from Isaiah. It was right there in the quote. The prophet Isaiah said, where was the message from? It was from God. Who wanted the people to turn their hearts back to God? God did. 
We need to remember, whoop, sorry about that, tongue tied there. Remember, why did God want this? Hold on to that thought. Let's continue on in Luke, because this is what comes next. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us. For they are persuaded that John was a prophet. Let's pause right there. What did John say his answer was? Follow me, I am the great prophet. I eat bugs and other things that you find living on trees and whatever. He didn't do that. He said, turn to God. He said, turn to God in a way they'd heard many, many times. Heard with their ears, but not in here. They could tell you what he'd said. They couldn't show it by what they were doing. John came 100% in the word of God. He didn't have to offer a new message because God's message was right from the beginning. Turn to me, I'll bless you. Turn to me, live by my standards. Why? Because I want what's best for you and I'm giving you that as your commandments and laws. And when you follow that, you won't suffer the way the other nations suffered. You won't have STDs, why? Because you won't be engaging in that kind of behavior. Don't engage in that behavior. Don't get the STD. Whoa! That's real complicated logic. No, it's plain and simple. And God didn't give him something complicated. He gave him something plain and simple. Don't be like those other nations. The ones sacrificing, the, yes, the ones sacrificing their kids. That's insanity. What value are you teaching your kids when you can cut them up, toss them on the altar, and let them fry? I'm sorry, that's terrifying. For the sake of the almighty dollar, whatever goes, goes, yay, rah, let's make some money. What are we gonna do? We're gonna sell that inappropriate lifestyle and behavior to the little kids. I'm, I'm not gonna name off the store, but we went into a department store when our kids were little. And you looked up at the pictures on the wall and you had to wonder what in the world are they thinking? Because those were some of the skimpiest little outfits that they were putting on those itty bitty girls. I'm thinking, first off, why would I pay your kind of prices for something that small? Secondly, what are you trying to tell the girls they are? There's a right value and there's a wrong value. And the wrong value is being marketed day in and day out. We need to realize, while this sounds complicated when we don't teach it the right way, when we tell it the plain and simple way, don't do the wrong. Avoid it, avoid it at all costs. Why? Not just because it'll take you down, it'll take your kids down. Do you love your kids? Give them a standard that's gonna save them. I'm not talking just eternally, I'm talking about the here and the now. Because how many 13 year old girl is ready to deal with pregnancy? They're not. They're not ready to deal with the biological part, let alone the mental part. How many boy, 13, 14, 12 years old, is ready to deal with the idea he got some girl pregnant? That there's a life out there that's there because of him. That there's a life out there going through who knows what because of his behavior. That's not me trying to say, oh, just don't do, just don't do, just don't do. That's God saying, you want to get through it a lot less painfully? I'm giving you awesome life advice. As God, I am telling you, you want the better for your family? You want the better for yourself? Listen to me. But this is a trap 
we say from men, the people will stone us. For they're persuaded John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it's from. Boy, are they lying. Because they didn't want to step in their own trap. If we give an answer, we're in trouble. Because either we should have been listening to God, I mean, I mean listening to John, except that all that John was saying was from God, or we should have been out there condemning a false prophet because he was not preaching from God's word, except we can't say that. Because everybody that heard him knew the truth that he put out there. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And I am doing even worse because I am getting less far through my slides. we got to realize, there is... A right way, a right way that isn't just right because God said so and he's bigger. It's a right way because God loves us, wants what's best for us, and the way he's put it is so that we will do better because he's given us the best answer possible. He's gone as far as you can think about all that took place you can take the Old Testament, you can take the New Testament. God was working as hard as a person could, except he's God, to show the people. Not just, I am God, I'm right. Because you can see that with the plagues. <laughs> Boom, I'm God, here it comes. Yeah, that was God all right. No, you weren't catching it, were you? Because with the 10 plagues, did they listen? Did they believe? No, they didn't. I'm talking about the Israelites. They didn't even listen and believe, as I said last week, with the cloud. Whether it was the pillar by day or the flame by night, they still didn't believe. When the waters part, they still didn't believe. When the water came crashing in, they finally believed. Look at Jesus. Same thing. He feeds thousands. They're sort of fallen, but they're fallen to fill their bellies. He heals. He gives the sight to the blind man. He gives hearing to the deaf. He raises a young little girl, he raises a widow's son, he raises Lazarus, and those are just the ones we know about. Because we know so much more was done that we don't have written in God's book. Because we don't have that kind of paper in time to be reading all the good that God did through his son. And how does he end it? Some would say he ends it by going to Calvary. No, he doesn't. Almost. He ends it by ascending on high. This doesn't end here. I am going to be with the Father so that you can too. So you can know I don't just die to die again. Because that's what's going to happen to Lazarus. That's what's going to happen to the little girl. That's what's going to happen to that young man who was the only son of that widow. They might rise, but they rise to die again because if all you've got is that CPR, ba-boom, and up, there they are. They're up and alive again. Their heart's beating. Their blood's moving. They're breathing. Isn't it great? No, because they're going to die again. This isn't about the die again answer. This is about the better for now, a better that carries on into eternity. And it's not about some super special sauce. It's about an answer God was willing to give from the beginning. Listen, obey. I will give. Gave the promised land, but they wouldn't listen and obey about it. Given bigger than that, giving us the hope of eternal salvation, if, if we will follow. A big if. And unfortunately, he's not going to make us. We have to make the choice to choose to follow. And I could easily go on for another hour, and I know you all killed me for that. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> but the long and the short of it is, 
You can't trap God. Why? That's not who he is. He isn't trying to manipulate you. He gives a straightforward, this is what I expect. I expect, and oh, by the way, you gain from my expectations. We're all called to make a choice. We can't outsmart him and come up with the stone that's so big God can't lift it. That's a nonsense question. You want nonsense? Tell me why you can't answer the question. Well, then I'd have to change. Yeah. Well, I really enjoy. You ready to pay the price for that? People make decisions and choose against God. And unfortunately, there's a big consequence to that. Boom! There it goes into the bucket. I'll fix it. Sometimes the fix is, that's too dangerous to have around. We're not comfortable with that. But what's the truth? How much do you have to undo a person to get them to become what they need to be? Oh, by the way, you can't do that. As much as I might want to have thought about doing it, the truth is I haven't got the time, I haven't got the ability to have done it right because I know how I could have done it wrong. There is a right way. We make the choice. There is the in the bucket way. We still make the choice. We choose to take him on in baptism and continue in him daily. Following his example. Why? Because daily he wants what's best for us. And we should say, Amen. Because daily he wants it better and better and better for us. It's in his word, it's in every example he shows. And sometimes that's in the, Whoa, look at that. That's awesome. People got fed, people got raised, people got healed. And sometimes it's in the boom, and it goes in the bucket. Woo, Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah. For our benefit. Because if they were going down that hard, that fast back then, look at why he destroyed the world with Noah. They were a violent, nasty piece of work. That's all they were. Better to chuck it and start fresh. Is that because God's mean and nasty? No, that's because that was mean and nasty. Dangerous and nasty. He's calling us in love. He's been calling the same way as he did back in Isaiah, back with Abraham, back in the beginning. Don't touch that. It's up to us to make the choice. If you need to take on Christ in baptism, you need the prayers of the church, you're welcome to come as we stand and sing.